in 399 BC, the famous 70-year-old Athenian philosopher Socrates faced trial on account of two charges, refusing to acknowledge the Greek gods and corrupting the youth. A trial convened in the middle of the city with not 12, but 500 jurors sitting on wooden benches and a crowd of spectators all around. His accusers were allowed three hours to present their case, after which Socrates was given three hours for his defense. And the case came to an immediate conclusion. Jurors placed small discs marked guilty or not guilty into an urn. The discs were counted and Socrates was found guilty, 280 to 220. Next came arguments about his sentencing. His accusers recommended death as the appropriate punishment, while Socrates suggested sarcastically he be rewarded for his crimes. When pressed for an actual punishment, he proposed a small monetary fine, and between his suggestion and that of his accusers, the jury chose death by forced suicide. He'd have to drink a cup of the poisonous hemlock. Well, it took a month for the sentence to be finally carried out, but on the day of his punishment, Socrates took a bath, spoke to his children about carrying out his wishes, and sent them off, rejoining his closest friends. His friend Credo advised him to take his time, to have some dinner and some wine, enjoy the company of his friends before drinking the poison late at night. But Socrates responded, I should only make myself ridiculous in my own eyes if I clung to life and hugged it when it has no more to offer. A servant came and handed him the cup. He received it cheerfully and then jokingly asked if he should pour some of it out, you know, as an offering to the gods. Socrates lifted the cup, drank it, and when his friends broke down weeping, he sternly rebuked them, adjuring them to be brave. And after laying down on the ground, he spoke his famous last words directed to his friend Credo. Credo, we owe a cock to Asclepius. Do pay it. Don't forget. Asclepius was the god of health. And when you were cured of some disease, you were to make an offering of a rooster as thanksgiving. It's unclear exactly what Socrates meant by these words. Either he was again being sarcastic, he was after all condemned precisely because of his disregard for the gods, or maybe he was being sincere, implying then that life is a disease and he is thankful to finally be cured of it. Either way, he died moments later. Well, this story is recounted by his most famous student, Plato, who concludes the story in his work titled Phaedo with these words, such was the end of our comrade, who was, we may fairly say, of all those whom we knew in our time, the bravest and also the wisest and most upright man. Now, there are questions about the accuracy of Plato's account, but insofar as it's factual, you could certainly say that Socrates died the way he lived, right? With wit and philosophical insight down to the very last breath. We're in a series this summer titled Talking to God, and we've been looking at different prayers in the Bible. Prayer is speech that arises from a real relationship with God. Prayer is neither a twisting of God's arm, forcing him to bend to our will, but neither is it weak and ineffective. You know, the only change happening to our perspectives. Prayer is covenant speech that arises from a real relationship, and it has an impact on both parties and on the world around us. And this morning... We're going to look at a prayer that represents the last words of a man named Stephen, similarly condemned for his beliefs. And as with Plato's account of Socrates, by looking at Stephen's last words, we're going to see that he died the way he lived. Not so much with wit and philosophical insight, but with faith and mercy. Open up, if you will, to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. If you didn't bring a Bible, there should be one underneath the seat in front of you, and it is on page 891 in those Bibles. 891, Acts chapter 7. 
So we're not going to turn there, but we're introduced to Stephen in chapter 6 as a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Acts 6, verse 5. Stephen is then chosen along with six others to oversee the early church's ministry to widows. He is also, however, a bold witness of the gospel of Jesus. Acts 6, 8 says that Stephen was full of grace and power. And some commentators think that you should take those two words together, grace and power, as an expression of his personality. He was charismatic or winsome. But you could also consider the expression not as being an expression of his personality, but as a description of his character. Taken separately, it means that Stephen was strong. He was filled with the power to do signs and wonders. We're actually told in the second half of verse 8. But he was also gracious, kind, tender, merciful. In other words, Stephen followed in the footsteps of his rabbi, Jesus. What happens next is that Stephen is opposed by a group of fellow Jews from a local synagogue who accuse him of the same thing they accuse Jesus of, blasphemy, namely speaking against the two holiest things in all of Judaism, the temple and the law. And in chapter 7, Stephen is brought to a trial, and he gives his defense. And we're actually going to look at this defense later this year, because we're going to be studying the book of Acts starting September 8th, but, but we won't look at it now. Stephen gives his defense, and then in the end, what he does is he, he boldly accuses his accusers. Look at verse 51, chapter 7. You stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the laws ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. I'm not going to go through this line by line. Just I want, I want to point out here that if Stephen is trying to secure a positive outcome in his trial, he's doing himself no favors, right? Accusing his accusers. Then look at the response, verse 54. When they heard these things... They became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. That last word there is more literally fell asleep. When he said this, he fell asleep, although falling asleep is a Greek euphemism for dying. You'll notice in his section here, uh, I think it's verse 58, that we're introduced to a character named Saul, who ends up being one of the most important characters in the book of Acts. But I want us to actually focus on Stephen's dying words. Did you notice that they are a prayer directed towards Jesus? Verse 59 again. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So this is a, a prayer to Jesus, and it's actually reminiscent of the words Jesus himself prayed on the cross. The the writer of Acts is a man by the name of Luke. And Luke also wrote a gospel, an account of Jesus's life and death. And in the gospel of Luke 23, 46, Jesus prays on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Quite similar to what Stephen prays here, right? And then look at the second part of Stephen's prayer, verse 60. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. So this too is reminiscent of the words Jesus prayed himself on the cross, again, according to the gospel of Luke. Jesus looked down at his executioners and said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. So here's the point that I'm trying to make here. Stephen died the way he lived, right? He died the way he lived in imitation of his rabbi Jesus. Jesus praying essentially those very words. 
Now, I want us to think more closely about these two parts of the prayer, beginning with the first. First, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, verse 59. There, there, there are many different ways people face death, right? I mean, some face death with sheer terror, especially in cases where the person didn't see it coming, when it all seems so unfair and unexpected, an accident, a natural disaster, heaven forbid, a murder. On the other hand, uh, some face death with bravado, especially in the movies, right? I think of a movie from 2011 called The Gray, starring Liam Neeson. He's hunted in the frozen Alaskan wilderness by a pack of wolves, and, and in the closing scene, he finds himself alone and surrounded. There's nowhere to escape. So he, takes, uh, he tapes uh, small broken alcohol bottles to one hand, a knife to the other. He recites a poem about fighting and living and dying, and then he charges straight at the alpha wolf. Still others face death, like Socrates, with one final witty word. Credo weo acoctus asclepius. Do pay it. Don't forget. Still others face death with just a sense of resignation, like Winston Churchill, whose famous last words were simply, I'm bored with it all. <laughs> Stephen faced death not with terror, nor bravado, nor wit, nor resignation, but with faith, right? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. With faith that as he breathed his dying breath, as his physical body expired, there was someone waiting for him, right? Someone waiting to receive him on the other side, namely Jesus. And I just wonder this morning whether we believe the same thing whether we really believe the same thing, that on the other end of our final breath, Jesus waits to receive us. Theologian Stanley Hauerwas notes a contrast between modern and medieval people when it comes to facing death. He says, I often ask lay audiences, that is, people who are not associated with medicine, how do you want to die? And the answers are almost always the same. They want to die quickly, in their sleep, painlessly, and without being a burden. They do not want to be a burden because they do not trust their children. <laughs> <laughs> they want to die quickly, in their sleep, and painlessly, because when they die, they don't want to have to know they're dying. He goes on to say, it is quite interesting to compare this way of dying with death in the Middle Ages. People in the Middle Ages wanted what modern people fear. That is, they wanted a lingering death. They feared a sudden death. They did so because they feared dying without having the time to be reconciled with their enemies, who were often their family, the church, and God. What's the difference between medieval and modern persons? He goes on to say, today we fear death. They feared God. Today we fear death. They feared God. They feared that as they went through life's final door, their God would be standing, and it was the prospect of that meeting, right, that provoked the real fear. And there was a sense that you'd better make sure you were ready for that meeting. You'd better make sure there was an unconfessed sin, unreconciled relationships. You'd better make sure you did everything possible to ensure that the face you met on the other side of that door was welcoming and not threatening to you, was proud and not disappointed in you. That was how medievals faced death. But you know, if there's one thing us moderns are sure of that medievals weren't, is that God's face is welcoming and kind, gracious and inviting. I don't think most of us fear meeting God on the other side. You know what we fear? And I'm not speaking for everybody here, perhaps most, we fear no one's there, don't we? Again, I know I can't speak for all of us, but I can speak for myself. I don't fear God is mean and unforgiving and condemning. I fear God doesn't exist. I fear there's nothing on the other side. That's why medievals feared God, but we fear death. And I'm challenged by Stephen's prayer because in contrast to modern persons, Stephen believes resolutely there is someone who is on the other side of that door. And in contrast to medieval persons, Stephen believes resolutely that person can be trusted with his soul. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. What about you? Do you fear death? Do you fear God? Or do you have faith? 
Well, the second part of his prayer, verse 60 again. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. So you'll remember that Stephen, with these words, again, is imitating his rabbi Jesus, who similarly forgave his executioners in the very middle of his dying. And it's a challenging prayer, isn't it? It is for me. I mean, maybe, maybe you could pray those first words, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But this? I mean, what would your last thought be about your enemies if they were in the process of killing you? Think about that for a moment. What would your final thought be for your enemies if they were in the midst of killing you? I'd want revenge, right? I'd want their comeuppance. I'd want God's wrath to be poured out on them. And if any, if any of you are with me this morning, that you can honestly say that's what you'd w- want to, guess what? We're in good company. In fact, we're in good biblical company. Ancient Israel's most famous king, King David, responsible for so many of the prayers we have in the Bible, you know, collected in the book of Psalms. King David, who is called a man after God's own heart, said these words on his deathbed. These are his last dying words. You're going to get a real kick out of this. Okay, so when David's time, this is from 1 Kings 2, when David's time to die drew near, he charged his son Solomon saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong, be courageous. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies as it's written in the law of Moses, so that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Then the Lord will establish his word that he spoke concerning me. If your heirs take heed to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail you a successor on the throne of Israel. Isn't this precious? Isn't this encouraging? David, a father on his deathbed, encouraging his son to walk in obedience to God. He reminds his son of God's promises. The only thing is, those aren't his last words because he continues. Moreover, you know also what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me, how he dealt with the two commanders of the armies of Israel, Abner, son of Ner, Amasa, son of Jether, whom he murdered, retaliating in time of peace for blood that had been shed in war, putting the blood of war on the belts around his waist and on the sandals on his feet. So here he is reminding Solomon of his former enemy, Joab, and all the wrongs previously committed. And so David then says this, act therefore according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. Sheol is the grave. Don't you dare let him die peacefully. He continues, Deal loyally, however, with the sons of Brazili, the Gileadite. Let them be among those who eat at your table, for with such loyalty they met me when I fled from your brother Absalom. Again, how nice, right? I mean, treat these men well, he says. Let them eat at your table. But unfortunately, he doesn't end. These are his last words. There is also with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjaminite from Behurim, who cursed me with a terrible curse the day when I went to Mahanaim. But when he but when came when he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death with the sword. Therefore, do not hold him guiltless. You're a wise man. You will know what you ought to do to him, and you must bring his gray head down with blood to Sheol. And then the very next line, verse 10, David slept with his ancestors. He died. That's King David, whose last words that he ever spoke according to the Bible, you must bring his gray head down with blood to shale. Just to make it clear, I don't condemn David for these words. I think that in a world of injustice, in a world where there's so much that isn't right, in a world in which things are done to us that aren't fair, I think it's only natural to want revenge, right? To have your final thought be the future judgment of your enemies. I don't condemn David at all. I think it's perfectly natural to go down swinging, hoping to take a few with you along the way. But Stephen shows us something unnatural, right? Maybe you could say it's supernatural. Final words of forgiveness and grace. How? That's my question. Why? Like, what enables Stephen to do this? To say, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. 
And, and for that matter, what enables the first part of his prayer? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. How does Stephen die with faith and mercy? Well, I think it has something to do with what happened right before the prayer. Something happened before his prayer, right before the stones started flying. Stephen actually had a vision. I don't know if you noticed that, but look at verse 55 again. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So this is an interesting vision. To see Jesus at God's right hand, or the right hand of God the Father, means that Jesus has power. You're supposed to picture a throne room with a, a king in the center. And the person on the king's right, the person sitting in the seat to his right, ha is the highest, most authoritative representative of the king. Could very well be, and often was, the king's son. The person sitting to the right of the king has his kingly authority, carries his kingly prerogatives, carries his kingly power. And what Stephen sees here, right before he's stoned, he has this vision of Jesus at God's right hand, sitting. Actually, not sitting. He's standing. But it's a confirmation. A confirmation of his life's commitment, right? A confirmation that Jesus wasn't just a good guy, wasn't just an interesting teacher, wasn't just a wandering cynic or an apocalyptic prophet. Stephen received the confirmation he needed to become the first ever Christian martyr. Stephen received in this moment the confirmation that the one he entrusted his life to, not just his death, right? The one he entrusted his entire life to was no less than God's authorized representative on earth no less than God the Father's Son. And of course, it's Stephen's testimony of this vision, we're told, that his accusers just can't handle. They cover their ears, they drag him out of the city, and they begin stoning him. They can't handle the idea that Jesus sits at God's right hand. And not many people can, right? I mean, if Jesus sits at God the Father's right hand, everything changes. You owe him your life, if that's true. You, you owe him your allegiance, if that's true. You'd better drop whatever you're doing and follow him if that's true. You'd better give him everything if that's true. But there's something else in this vision. I now already sort of unfortunately gave it away. It's a curious detail that's easy to overlook. In the vision that Stephen has, Jesus isn't sitting as we'd expect him to, right? He's standing. Why is Jesus standing? You know, when Jesus himself was on trial, according to the Gospel of Luke, he was questioned about his identity by the same council that tried and condemned Stephen. And Jesus said to that council, referring to himself, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. It's a reference to himself. And the council responded with shock, asking, are you then the Son of God? And Jesus kind of quips, uh, you said it first. Again, to sit at God's right hand is to be the authorized representative, perhaps even to be God's son. Again, we're to picture a palace. We're to picture a throne room. So then why, in Stephen's vision, is Jesus standing? Where is Stephen right now? Like, what's going on? What, what's, what's the context? It's a trial, right? Stephen is on trial. And do you know who stands in a trial? Stands up? for the accused in an ancient trial? An advocate. An advocate stands up for the accused in an ancient trial. What's going on here, I think, is that yes, Stephen is having a vision of a throne room and he sees Jesus in power, sees Jesus as God's authorized representative, Jesus perhaps as God's son, but he's also having a vision of a courtroom. Because remember, Stephen is on trial and he stands accused. And what he sees is his advocate. Not just before the human judges associated with his trial, the ones holding rocks in their hands. It's not just this trial that Stephen faces. You know, as Stephen faces life's final door, he knows there is some sort of trial on the other side. He knows that there is someone on the other side of that door who has pretty high standards. Someone who is perfect and holy and just. And what Stephen, I think, realizes is that the same Jesus who stands for him here will stand for him there too. Jesus will always be his advocate on earth and also in heaven. 
That's why Stephen can pray what he prays, because Stephen knows he has an advocate. Stephen knows that Jesus stands for him. And because of that, he knows that on the other side of that final door is mercy and grace. And because Stephen knows that on the other side of that final door is mercy and grace, because when he peers into the future, he sees forgiveness and healing, love and joy that he's about to enter into, he can say, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And this, friends, is the key to dying well. The key to facing death like Stephen. It's that he saw Jesus in power, but also in love, right? As king and also as advocate. It wasn't that Stephen had this extraordinary willpower to generate the virtues of courage and faith and mercy on his own. It wasn't that he was just able to muster up what he needed to face his death. He saw Jesus. That's my prayer for you all. You know, some of you in this room are young kids maybe even just joining us here in the worship service for the first time, and you're thinking right now, why didn't I go to Sunday school this morning? All this talk about death, this pastor's morbid. You're going to have to go home and ask your parents because you don't even know what morbid means. But if you're a kid this morning, perhaps you've never thought of your death, and that's okay. But you probably still face trials. You probably still face difficult situations at school, at home, where you feel like you're under trial and you don't measure up. Here's my simple prayer for you. May you see Jesus standing for you. Some of you are high school, college, post-college, and yes, maybe you know what the word morbid means, but you think about your death as often as kids do, namely not at all. I know that's not true of everybody in this room, but maybe most. You have, you know, your whole life in front of you at least. You know, that, that, that's how it feels. Anyways, you still have enemies. You still have people eager to throw stones in your direction. May you see Jesus standing for you. You know, some of you have been around long enough to experience the death of someone else, someone you love dearly, a child, a parent, a spouse, a sibling, a close friend. And because of that, you you probably feel isolated and alone. It's like you've got this gaping wound that won't shut, and yet everyone around you pretends that it doesn't, they don't notice. You know, you feel like you're an alien in this world because of your loss, because you carry with you at every moment of every day, whether consciously or not, the death of that person. Everywhere you go, you can't escape it. Death feels like it follows you because of that wound. And here's my simple prayer for you. May you see Jesus standing for you. Some of you think about your death a lot. You've been forced to. Your health is failing. Your body doesn't recover like it used to. The issues keep mounting and the doctors are no real help. You're scared of what's on the other side. May you see Jesus standing for you, ready to receive you. Church, may we all see Jesus. May he pervade our thoughts. May he be the thing that pervades our minds. May he captivate our attention. May he be our vision. Here's my prayer for you. I'll close with this. Be thou our vision, O Lord of our hearts. Not be all else to us, save that thou art. Thou our best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence our light. Riches we heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou our inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in our heart, high king of heaven, our treasure thou art. High king of heaven, our victory won. May we reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of our own heart, whatever befall, still be our vision, O ruler of all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to see you. We want to see you. We want to experience you. We want to feel you. We want you to captivate our attention. We want you to be our best thought. We want you to be our inheritance. 
We want you to be our vision, whatever befall. In Jesus' name, amen.